built a small house in Amritsar. And uh, he, my grandfather was a lawyer. And uh, he, I think, practiced to the age of about 51, 52. The day my father joined profession, my grandfather decided to retire. And uh, my father would say that he started off with virtually, I think after three months he earned about five rupees, the first one. And, but he was very enthusiastic, he was a very bright student. In his school, uh, in his college, he was head of the debating society. He used to do writing, swimming, and so on and so forth. And he therefore started off, and was a very young and enthusiastic uh, person. He, he would say that, look, I would make sure that my bicycle was absolutely polished and so on and so forth. He was fond of new notes. So he would go to one bank, pick up the old notes, go to the next bank, make sure that he had absolutely crisp notes. He'd, he'd do all that. And very fond of debating and things like that. So I think over a period of time, his practice flourished and he became the leading lawyer in Amritsar. One thing he would say was that, look, if somebody came to him with a bad case, he would straight away tell him that, look, you do not have a good case and you know, would, would not ask him to go for litigation in those cases. So therefore, he, he became fairly well known. And, uh, you know, he was part of all social activities. My grandfather was a very leading lawyer in Amritsar, so that was a great support. My grandfather had a great reputation for integrity. <clears throat> great. My father's written in one of the small things that, you know, after my grandfather had given away practice, about two years later, a person came to him and said, Sir, you had helped me and when you were in profession, and he gave him a small bundle of money. This was two years after the entire incident had happened. And my grandfather got violent and threw him out of the house saying, why have you done this? So I think those are the values that he gave him. So he, his practice grew, and uh, by about 1950-51, he, he wrote the, whatever the exams were for becoming a district judge. So, you know, he became an additional district judge, and we shifted to Ferozpur. So, Ferozpur was a place where there were maximum number of murder cases, and uh, he found it very difficult. You know, he could not sleep well at night, so he had to be treated. I think after six months or a year, he sort of recovered, because there were a lot of death sentences he had to pronounce, and it was, it was very tough for him. He used to recollect one particular case where there was a father and a son who both were arraigned for murder. And he acquitted the father. And he convicted the father, but acquitted the son. And the father, rather than being saying, listen, I've been given a death sentence, said, may God take the highest court. That was the sort of reaction people have when you know, their loved ones are involved. So after a period of about three years in Ferozpur, I think it was a big, big uh, training. He was first a regional district judge, then he became the district judge. We shifted to Umbala, and then again he was there for the judge. It was a lonely existence because as a judge, he, there was not much of socialization that he would do. It was predominantly, you know, it was a small, well-knit family, and that was it. They were again in Umbala, again, there were always these murder cases and so on and so forth. So he, he spent two years in Nambala. Then he, he moved on to Delhi. Uh, he was, uh, you know, there was at that particular point of time, a very major industrialist called Ram Krishnadalvi, who was probably the largest industrialist at that particular point of time. And uh, he was asked to investigate a particular case against him. So this, this was a one-year assignment that he had done in Delhi. That was a very, very large case very prominent at that point of time. Every day it would be reported in newspapers and so on and so forth. And uh, the, the, he, you know, Dalmia brought in, for a district judge court, brought in uh, uh, you know, lawyers from UK and so on and so forth. And at the end of it all, uh, you know, after the hearing was over, I still really like like the peak of summer. And the judgment had to be delivered. He brought all the papers home, and because the papers would fly, then he would not put on the fan. And in a period of what, one and a half, he had the secretary dictated the judgment in peak summer, 
without a fan, without an air conditioner. And then, uh, you know, he, he uh, gave an imprisonment sentence uh, to Ram Krishnadalmiya for a period of two years. And, uh, the, you know, the court, the case went up to High Court, Supreme Court, and his judgment was upheld. The postscript of that was that, you know, Ram Krishnadalmiya went for two years to jail, and he had used every means during that particular one year to some other make sure that he could influence him in some manner. And, you know, several of our relations were approached, several other people were approached, you know, but nobody could do anything about it. And, you know, after he went away, and 15 years later or 20 years later, Ram Krishnadalmiya had absolute respect. He says he was a person who could not influence him. Whenever there's a function in his house, he would make sure that send his wife or somebody and said, can you please call this person? So that, that, that was one, one of the big cases that he had, Ram Krishnadalmiya, one year that was a special assignment. After that, uh, you know, there was a period of about four years, he was a district and session judge in Delhi. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a prominent uh, place. And then he, uh, you know, did his whatever had to be done. Uh, and uh, then he moved to Punjab High Court. Punjab High Court was part of uh, the Delhi. Delhi uh, did not have a separate High Court during that particular period of time. So <clears throat> he would come and work both in Himachal. Himachal also didn't have High Court. He would both go to Simla and to Delhi for this. And I think when he moved to the High Court, uh, probably he must have been very good at his work because the Chief Justice of uh, there was an Englishman at that point of time, one Justice Falshaw. He took a liking for him, and uh, all the important cases were this thing. They were very quick to decide. He would come home and, you know, be with us for about half an hour, and then the next three, four hours, he'd be working very hard. And I used to say that, look, none of his cases were kept pending for more than three, four days. He was able to dispose of cases very, very quickly. When people used to come to him and say, listen, what's wrong with the legal profession? Why cases take too long? He would always quote statistics that look, when he was the district and session judge in Delhi, these were the total number of cases that were there. Four years later, the cases had gone down by 30% or 40%. His basic view was that people had to work hard and they, you know, these cases would go wrong. There was nothing wrong with the system. And therefore, he was very quick. He would work... You know, by the time he would come, let's say, from the court at 4.35, after having his cup of tea between 5 to 8.30, he would be working. And then, if something was bothering him, then very often you'll see him at 3 o'clock in the morning, going back to the office and rewriting everything in his own hand and give it to this thing. He was fortunate to have a very good handwriting. And therefore, he would, uh, you know, uh, the next day the standard would come and type it all that. But that was not uncommon to, for him to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Something was bothering him, and he would do that. He'll wait for his work. He was very fond of his evening walk. He'll take this walk, morning walk, everything is there. But uh, while well, he was very, you know, uh, pleasant minded, but nobody could ever influence him. That, that was it. There was a certain distance that he would maintain with everybody, whether it was his own son or anybody else, nobody could influence him. So he moved to the high court, and they were for obviously his talent must have been recognized because uh, he was a junior judge, he was given all the important cases. And then uh, when the Delhi High Court was formed, I think uh, whoever was in this thing said, Look, here's a good judge, we should send him to Delhi High Court. So that was a great opportunity, otherwise, he would have never become uh, Chief Justice. So over a period of time, he became the Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court. I'm sure there would be certain very important cases at that particular point of time. And then he became a judge of the Supreme Court of India. Uh, during that period, I think there were two very major cases that he heard. One was the Keshwanan Bharti case, which I think again he recounted fairly well in his book and the Habeas Corpus case. In Keshwanan Bharti case, I think his judgment became the ultimate uh, decider. Absolutely. And I think he was, I think. In many ways, I think it was a very pragmatic judgment. Pragmatic in the sense that had he held that you know, any other way, it would have been overturned by the government. And uh, I think when that matter came up for review again, you probably know, uh, 
the, the government could not find any reason why they needed to amend it. And I think the basic structure theory, we are very fortunate to have that. And the other one was the right of habeas corpus. And I think those were both very important uh, judgments. And then, uh, you know, obviously these were not, it was a lonely existence, extremely lonely existence at that particular point of time, in times of emergency. But I think he stood to his uh, guns and then I think he was superseded and uh, he resigned. That was it.